afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Aviva Weinraub. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Digital Strategies at Northwestern University and the co-product uh, director for the Avalon Project with John Dunn at Indiana. Um, so we're just going to get started. Okay. Um, so uh, the Simvera application, this Simvera application is called Avalon Media Systems. Uh, it is an open source system for managing and providing access to large collections of digital audio and video co-developed by the libraries at Indiana University Bloomington and Northwestern University. Version 6.4 of the software was just released, and as far as we currently know, because of course I think all of us know that tracking open source software has some difficulties, uh, there are 12 other academic institutions that are using Avalon Media Systems, uh, and this project software has been supported by multiple grants from IMLS and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The overall goal of the 2015 uh, two-year Mellon grant that we just received was to figure out ways, sorry, the two-year Mellon grant was to figure out ways to sustain ongoing support and development for Avalon. And as part of our most recent IMLS grant, we were able to partner with Lyricist to run a pilot project with nine partner institutions that span a diverse range of use cases and institution types. So I'm going to talk a little bit about running Avalon in AWS at Northwestern, and then I'm going to pass it on to John to talk um, about the Lyricist pilot, and then uh, we'll pass it along to Carl to talk about uh, what it was like to actually run it as a local institution. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. So in support of the Mellon Grant, one of the specific deliverables was to deploy Avalon in the cloud as a proof of concept for potential vendors to provide the software to customers as a hosted solution. Northwestern was primed to take on this part of the grant since Northwestern had signed a larger contract with AWS, a larger campus contract. So in late spring, early summer of 2017, uh, we migrated and upgraded our instance of Avalon uh, from NU's local infrastructure to AWS. Our migration ran smoothly with the care and attention of a single developer, and we are now fully in production on AWS. So as of March 2018, uh, we publicly have available 140 uh, moving images and 851 audio items. Uh, but logged in, we have a, a number of things that require you to log in. We have 3,430 moving images and 4,029 audio items. So because of the grant timeline and the academic calendar, uh, we had to move fairly quickly in getting this up and running. That meant that we relied on the lead developer at the libraries to do the bulk of the work that, since he had worked with the DevOps at Indiana in actually creating Avalon 6.0, which was our first version that could run in AWS. So getting all of this to deploy cleanly with the right settings in the correct dependency order represented the steepest part of the learning curve for us. And in complex systems, one cannot expect to just move things to AWS. It really requires the work of rethinking the grant from the ground up in many instances. So I don't actually expect that you'll be able to read this image. Um, <laughs> but this is a resource dependency graph for the underlying Semvera stack on the left and Avalon on the right. Uh, so it should give you some idea if you can sort of vaguely see the lines that are there. This is a really complex system. It's a fairly complex piece of software because it involves streaming and transcoding, which makes it actually a really great candidate for AWS in terms of utilizing available services. So moving to AWS involved many lessons learned for our technical teams at the library. So um, one of the big mistakes that we actually made was that we did not involve our own DevOps from the start. And I'm, I, I, I don't think that I can emphasize this enough. This was a huge, huge mistake. AWS allows for a different approach or mindset to architecting systems and developing code, uh, sort of the infrastructure as code, if you were, is something that your DevOps will need to embrace and to actually internalize. So where did this impact us and why is that important? Well, when it comes to maintenance and support, our DevOps will still need to be able to provide support for these systems. So not having our DevOps on board caused us some issues and I'll point some of those out. So that requires properly understanding how those systems work so that they can be uh, properly monitored. They need to understand the system so that they can troubleshoot and fix issues. And DevOps had to get up to speed to be able to do this kind of work. So for example, uh, we did not have the alerts and monitoring set up correctly. 
So we were switching from SolarWinds, which is at our data center, to CloudWatch, which is in AWS, and it brought some significant changes in logic and the approach to how alerts should be set up in a system designed to self-heal and expand to meet demands. This led to a component of the system not restarting properly overnight, but to AWS, everything seemed fine, so an outage was not identified until the application was not working for 8 a.m. classes. So um, we had some serious issues with this. Nobody really knew who was responsible, how to fix it, what the problem was. Um, and it really, it, this was a, a, an issue with our, our system just not alerting us properly. So it's really important that you make sure that you're, you're sh sure that your staff has the training support that they need before you make this kind of migration. This is essential for maintenance and support because the lingo in AWS is very specific to AWS. And it will take time to train your staff and we're using a combination of vendor classes uh, that work toward various certifications and ramping up is uh, participation in various campus groups. In fact, we're taking a real leadership role in that on campus. As far as digging into the code goes, during the pilot phase, a lot of tweaks were necessary to get the code for this complex system deployed in AWS to run properly. And our library DevOps assisted in reviewing and modifying the code with our lead developer to reflect all the necessary tweaks and changes so that it could really build Avalon and AWS from start to finish properly. This process became an early step in bringing our DevOps up to speed on Avalon and AWS and how best to support and maintain this environment. Now, I sort of mentioned this before, but it's really important for you to take the time to re-architect your systems. So not all lessons learned from this, from this were a problem for us, and this was something that we actually did really well. Um, so depending upon what you're wanting to move to AWS, you may need to spend a fair amount of time rethinking and re-architecting your system for the cloud. This is beneficial because it will help optimize how the system will run in the cloud to take advantage of how the cloud works, for instance. For instance, sorry, transcoding services from AWS completely changed how we manage this part of our work. Uh, sorry, I lost my place. Oops, okay. Um, so right, okay, so transcoding for video scales up really well. So, um, uh, right, okay. I think I'm in the right spot. Okay, um, so the, one of the big things that you need to do is, sorry, transcoding scales really well. So you need to prepare your content for the repository, which is going to include spikes in your resource intensive work, such as ingest of large archival materials, which very great, vary greatly due to size and the type of work or project request. So we can now ingest and transcode thousands of minutes of audio and video in a fraction of the time that we could do on our local infrastructure, because that was not really scalable in real time because of hardware limitations. So the savings in time it takes to transcode means, for example, that we can easily say yes to ingesting large archival collections of, say, ensemble performances um, that are, because of AWS, the collection is available in a much shorter time frame. And actually, we've seen tremendous speed changes in the way that we're able to ingest content for, um, for classroom delivery. So if somebody comes in on a Monday morning and says, I have a three-hour movie, we can have that up and running for them within, within an hour. So um, this, so uh, anyway, so in sum, for these two benefits, AWS means that we can really easily scale to meet seasonal demand. Um, and if w they were on premise, this would mean adding many physical servers and simply this is, we just wouldn't be able to handle that. Um, the cost for that would just be absolutely astronomical for us. So the system also self heals. Uh, so if a component goes down, AWS simply rebuilds it. This is a huge benefit for our DevOps and our developer staff because before when a component went down, there was an outage. Now, assuming that of course we have everything set up properly and our alerts let us know everything, uh, the system should be up and running basically 24 seven. So generally AWS provides our developers and DevOps ease of deploying and maintaining systems and it means that we only pay for what we're using, which is a shift in our libraries since we've really primarily been working on um, uh, uh, you know, these sort of one-time one costs moving into the sort of recurring cost uh, model. <coughs> so, sorry. This is not actually moving forward. All right, so we're gonna talk, a, this is a snapshot of costs from September to March uh, of this year. 
So uh, we've spent $13,682 in total for production. This gives us more insight now into what our repository costs us. I'm going to give you guys real numbers to, to talk about, and um, that you know, may or may not be what you want, but I'm going to give them to you anyway. Um, so in the September to February six-month period, we ingested 2,151 items. So an item is either an audio item or a video item. 1,785 were audio items that are considered an archival collection. 222 were new course reserve videos, and the other 100 or so were music. We streamed to about 100, sorry, 1,100 courses a year uh, based on last year's staff stacks of online course reserves. Since we only pay for what we use, the budgeting for this is very different, and the cost is now an operational cost as opposed to a capital expense. So it's really important to track these expenses carefully so that accurate estimates can be made for budget purposes. But this impacts our growth as well, and adding additional services, moving over additional services and systems to AWS will increase the annual operating costs. And I'm not sure about you, I mean, every institution that I've ever worked at, we usually use year-end funds to buy servers. We're not necessarily thinking of, of running these systems as a, an ongoing operating cost. It requires us to have a very significant change in the way that we talk about running our technology systems in-house. Uh, that's been an interesting conversation on campus as well. So, um, all right, so um, a brief snapshot of some of the services and what they cost. So S3 storage of derivatives for us is about $600. As we add more content, we're seeing approximately a 5% increase in monthly costs. EC2 is uh, stable and consistent at around $270 a month. CloudFront went from a high of $200 for October to $10 in December. Uh, this service facilitates uh, high availability of our streaming derivatives around the globe. And cost fluctuates based on demand. So we're assuming that the number of courses streaming audio and video in October was much higher than December since classes uh, were mostly over and the school year was on break by December. Elastic Transcoder, which transcodes or converts our media into streaming derivatives, costs fluctuate based on the, the minutes of media that are actually transcoded. So for example, we spent $1,400 for creating uh, derivatives for a large audio collection that we ingested from our Bean and School of Music, um, and it was about 150,000 minutes of music. So I do want to mention here in, in the costs that we still have needs for our on-premise storage for our archival content for our repository. This is a, a key component of our preservation plans. So having an archival assets on-prem in a storage system that fulfills requirements like being geographically diverse in the event of a natural disaster and the ability to perform integrity checks is key to our mandate to keeping these assets for many future generations to come. Um, I have a whole bunch of lists of what it actually costs for us to run uh, these things on-prem, which I'm going to go through pretty quickly for you, just to give you an idea. Um, so uh, transcoding hardware for us was about $12,755 a year, which needed to re be replaced every five years. Streaming hardware, $13,593, again, replacing about every five years. A streaming license was about $800 a year. Uh, Isilon costs for five years, so uh, we're currently using 287 terabytes, um, was costing us about a million dollars for our portion. Uh, we've paid to our local NUIT, which is our central IT unit, about $600,000 in service costs and some of those nodes. Um, we uh, centrally paid for some of the nodes last year. We funded the library about $200,000 of that. Again, seeing this as a cost that will end is dependent upon whether or not Glacier, for example, um, is seen as a replacement for Isilon as we reach um, Isilon's limits and meet our geographic diversity requirements. We have a number of unknown costs that would end or that may be replaced by this amount. So what it's actually going to cost for us to run this uh, production systems in a managed hosting environment from our central IT unit. Um, the cost of the repository staging in the cloud, um, and the staff time setting up and managing servers that should be less than what it takes to get systems up and running in AWS. So since DevOps will still have to manage other servers uh, for you locally, this comparison is sort of one of those apples to oranges things. So I'm going to hand everything off now to John, who's going to talk about the Avalon pilot that we ran with Lyricist using funds from our most recent IMOS grant.
<clears throat> Thanks, Aviva. Um, for those <coughs> who don't know, I'm John Herbert. I'm the Director of Technology Services at Lyricis. Um, we were approached by Aviva and uh, John uh, Dunn from Indiana about a year ago to participate uh, in the a pilot of the Avalon Media Services as a part of the, the, their latest round of funding from IMLS. We were particularly intrigued by the opportunity because <clears throat> I assume because you're here listening to us uh, of the sort of larger problem that video uh, repositories are trying to solve for um, <clears throat> academic libraries and others. Um, as, as I understand it, at least as we launched into this round of funding, you know, what, what we did and what Aviva did at Northwestern, this was the first deployments of Avalon in the cloud. Uh, interestingly, um, our hosting services, we operate on SoftLayer, which is IBM's equivalent, quote unquote equivalent to Amazon, to AWS. Um, it doesn't provide some of the features and, and functionality that AWS does, um, which was a little bit of a negative, but I think the positive for us, the take that helped uh, us understand well and better is that Avalon isn't designed specifically for AWS and is capable of running on different uh, cloud web services. So that's a positive, certainly. Um, similar to what uh, Northwestern did, we ran a, a six month window of active testing from, sep oh, thank you, from uh, <laughs> September of last year to February of this year. And nine, you can see the nine institutions there. University of Oklahoma, Carl's sitting to my left, he's going to uh, talk more specifically about their participation in the pilot and, and speak more about a, a specific uh, participant's experience. You can, you can see the others there. Largely academic libraries, although DC Public and the University, well, University of the Arts, but the DC Public is there, and Houston Public. <clears throat> um, thanks. Um, so we, Unlike Northwestern, who had experienced users with Avalon, we were uh, piloting, and, and our uh, clients, our participants in the pilot, were we assumed new to this to the platform. So we had to sort of we, we broke the fa the pilot into three distinct phases. We spent the first phase introducing the product, giving them specific training on how to use it. The second phase was with scripted protocols. We sort of gave them, take this object, upload it with this, uh, with this metadata. And then the third phase was just sort of open where they could actually engage with their own content in their own way. Um, through <clears throat> the, the large majority of the pilot, we were running version 6.2, although towards the end, uh, we brought 6.3 in. Um, as you might expect, with nine institutions, we were able to ingest uh, most every audio or uh, AV file type. Um, most though, and I, I believe Avalon's designed mostly for access, uh, were access copies with some <coughs> mezzanines. Uh, digital masters, master copies were not engaged. Uh, do folks understand the difference between master okay, and <clears throat> mezzanine and access? The, the largest use of it amongst the nine was about 500 gigabytes. Um, in fact, it was interesting for as enthusiastic as our participants were, one of sort of the limitations of the pilot was them actually getting access to large quantities of source data at their institution. So we would have liked sort of more scale run at it because bandwidth is a serious issue as you start to trans, uh, transmit over the wire. Um, but, um, well, anyway, unfortunately we couldn't get there. <clears throat> we, we did implement, uh, our tech lead implemented a uh, script in the ingest process to actually directly integrate with DuraCloud um, and um, actually take two copies and, and, and this is where we're, through DuraCloud we were connecting to AWS putting one in S3 and one in Glacier if folks understand the difference uh, <clears throat> there so okay <clears throat> so some of our findings um, <clears throat> at, um, so our, our assessment of version six is that for a hosted service, there are some, some gaps in the service and functionality that, that it provides. I think Carl may get into a little bit more detail. We, we did an interesting exercise. We asked all the participants, we sort of gave them, I think it was a thousand points, and we had a, assembled a list of about 40 
uh, proposed improvements and we let them spend, spend their points and assign their points to however many of these um, improvements they would like to. So what it, it since gave us was a ranking and a priori prioritization of the improvements. So <clears throat> just to run through um, some of them, there's a need for more customizations to um, be able to sort of add, edit, uh, metadata fields to customize it more for uh, local collections and actually have collection level uh, configuration. Uh, batch functionality, of course, as with most digitization services, is a big um, uh, need. It's, it's a um, large requirement because you want to deal with uh, your digital assets in bulk. Uh, the manifest creation was, uh, I think, challenging for new um, users of the platform. So getting the manifest created correctly and also to have a batch sort of validation tool would be helpful. I, I know some other programs use a similar sort of tool. Uh, integrations, as you might expect with most platforms today, repository platforms, integration and discoverability uh, is a big issue. Integration with a uh, IR platform in particular and some as uh, with video and audio, the, there's obviously a speaking component, so transcription service integrating with that would be nice. And sort of better uh, UI and error messaging, I think, I think would help. Uh, it's important to also, I think, say uh, what wasn't tested. Um, as I mentioned, sort of large scale patron streaming wasn't orchestrated into the testing protocol. It was largely individual institutions and the staffs there streaming it out. So what would it take if you were streaming, uh, I don't know, some uh, popular uh, video, you know, with 200 people, let's say, uh, watching it at once. So that, that sort of large scale patron streaming wasn't uh, tested. Uh, authorization, the AuthN, AuthC uh, integration was not tested. Um, it's an interesting issue, I think, because um, I don't know if Aviva mentioned this, but Avalon's, of course, built on top of Sambera, and I think this is a component of Sambera that's not yet sort of finalized and complete. So the, the, the off-end and the off-C type of integration is something that Avalon assumes the deployer is going to be able to do themselves. So um, an edge case was integrating with the learning management system. I think you touched on this a little bit. You can, you can sort of see where videos and audio is used in the classroom and connecting it to a, an LMS uh, would be good. Uh, scale testing, I mentioned, and, and bandwidth, not uh, stress tested. So now there's a, a bit.ly there. Um, I don't know if the, the um, what would be a little, sorry about that. It'll, <laughs> I've done that more than once uh, in other presentations, but uh, I'm assuming that's on the video. Anyway, the bit.ly there is actually the full report that we're submitting to IMLS and uh, that'll be a part um, uh, of the sort of formal reporting out uh, of the uh, pilot. All right, next steps. Um, <coughs> there's not a, not, not a lot of rocket science here. So um, we're recommending, of course, that the sort of gaps in functionality be brought into the development cycle and the road tech, tech roadmap uh, whenever is reasonable. We assume uh, version seven is, is a good opportunity for at least some of that, the better UI and collection management support we understand are coming along. Um, some um, hosted service deployment needs, some, some of which, you know, just outlined would, would be good. Uh, user account management, the batch loading. Um, and interestingly, Oberlin College um, has asked us to continue, and, and actually IMLS is providing support for us to do this, to continue to host them through the end of June. So we're going through a process now to literally migrate their data in from their old system called variations, mm -hmm. I think. So, um, that's that's an interesting migrations are always tricky uh, so we're going through these steps with Oberlin to actually more simulate how a hosted client could come on with legacy data we would need to migrate and bring on that's a work in progress um, and then finally um, almost every participants keen to retest and once version 7 is available we might come back to this and, and pilot uh, pilot uh, test it some more so with that um, we'll Passing on to Carl. So. Sure. All right. Can you all hear me? Okay. Good. All right. So.
Um, by the way, I caught the term DevOps quite a bit, and if you don't know what that means, we're actually running a session tomorrow to introduce that concept. So, you know, if you don't know, stop by our session tomorrow on the schedule. Why did we participate in this test? Well, I think uh, there were a lot of reasons. And the first was that we are currently running what is an in-house system on FileMaker Pro. Uh, it's really just for staff. And to say that we maintain it with uh, you know, bubblegum bailing wire would be a really generous description. So the librarians have been after me for quite a while. Let's get a system in. We've been looking at Avalon as a local install. But I wasn't thrilled with supporting another platform in-house. I was not particularly happy about that at all. But we knew we needed a, um, if I can get this to work, <coughs> I knew we needed a streaming media platform for audio files and for our video. Secondary, but we have a lot of audio in our fine arts library that needs to get out there. So we've really been moving in that direction. I'm a huge fan of hosted platforms, and I really like us to get as much of that in the hosted environment as we can. I don't want having my librarians have to find the particular recording that the user is looking for. That's a waste of their time. I don't like having my tech team spending their time maintaining a back end. I want them adding value for the users on the front end. So I'm really pushing for that. I'm also a huge believer in network effect. So <clears throat> while this is not a multi-tenant system, uh, and needs to be in my opinion, but what I'm trying to do is get as much of our content loaded in an environment where it can be shared with others, and that's important to me. Uh, network effect is this you know, value that we see in Amazon and Google and all over the place where the more users you get at using a service, the more users are attractive. Well, obviously, as librarians, we can't keep our head in the sand about network effect. We have got to get into the, into the field and compete with <coughs> I think Joan was just talking about that a little bit in her talk. So that was important. I think we were also looking for a better display of the metadata elements because, you know, I know from being on the vendor side of the fence, um, I've never met a music cataloger that I could keep happy. Um, you know, it's just, wow, they, they have a whole other dimension of metadata that they want. And so we need to do a much better job there. We know that our discovery interface on our current system is too generic for them and will never make them happy. So we're looking for, for better support in that area. And then, of course, the other thing we loved about the test was the cost was right. You know, it was really, they, they did that really well. So we were pleased with that. So let me tell you a little about, about our, uh, our specific needs as a result if, of If I could just stuff. add, for, for the participants, the cost was zero, so anyway, from yes. us. Right price. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so what we, we came up with, and you've seen some of this in the slides before, of course, is that we really do want to see metadata fields. They're far too defined at the moment. They still need more flexibility, and, and particularly when harvesting, when we were trying to crosswalk these records, uh, we were finding we couldn't do the things we needed to do. Um, as I mentioned, it's not multi-tenant software, which we feel strongly it should be. Uh, then we also want to see better support for DPLA. We are a DPLA hub at OU Libraries in Oklahoma. And so we are feeding as much as we can into DPLA. And we didn't find that the system as currently uh, put together had really good connections that would enable us to, to interface with DPLA. Uh, we didn't get to test, as I think John mentioned, it. The, the metrics, and, and of course we want to get into that because we are under the same pressure I'm sure many public institutions are, if not private, that we're increasingly having to show what's the actual usage, what, you know, can we go into the impact of those usage statistics, um, and, and we didn't get a chance to look at that. And of course the last thing we're really looking for is the uh, CAS integration um, so that we can have this you know, logged in very simply and easily. So that was some of what we were looking for. Here's the rest of what we were looking for. He, he mentioned the points voting system, which we, we like that kind of system. It forces users to prioritize to some degree what they're really looking for. And what we spent our points on when we voted were primarily the OAI PMH interface. Again, that would help us with DPLA quite a bit. Uh, we wanted better batch export capabilities. And then we were looking at batch metadata modification capabilities. 
So that was also important to us as we went through this. And obviously, I've already mentioned statistics. And then finally, uh, we were looking at the workflows and how configurable were they to match the, the uh, processes we were using in-house. Although I will say there, I think that's a place where lots more discussion is needed. Again, having served on the vendor side of the fence for many years in this field, um, I think we don't spend enough time trying to come up with best practices and trying to get libraries to evaluate what they're doing in light of what might be a better practice and could we all come down to a little more agreement on processes. I've always said, if you ask 200 programmers how you should catalog something, you will get 200 answers. Um, that's ridiculous. We, we've got to do better in this profession. Uh, we can't afford what we're doing. So items that we really, um, really liked and that I really want to call these folks out for, um, we thought lyricists taking on this kind of a role was really uh, very, very admirable. That, you know, you put it in a test environment where you could collect input from a number of uh, people together. You brought us together where we could have conversations um, and hear each other talking about how we were using it. I thought that was uh, really quite good. So, you know, we were pleased uh, with that. Uh, we want to say that we thank them for this. We also thank IMLS uh, for, for providing the funding. We thought that was uh, great, and we very much appreciated that as well. Uh, we like the structure of the test. We thought they did a particularly good job of putting it together. He just described some of that for you. But that was very useful, and it kind of kept us all focused on evaluating the same types of things. Again, trying to bring us to some agreement, because uh, you know, otherwise we'll all go off like stray cats, uh, looking at different things. And so that was well done, I thought. We did come out of this feeling like this is a viable system for us, that we will be able to work with the system in the future. So we were very pleased with that result. And then, again, I think I already mentioned this one, we provide, they provided a form uh, for finding best practices. And then, again, the enhancement process being linked to a way to prioritize needs. This is a good way to move forward and getting some focus on them. And then the person that we worked with rather continually throughout this process was Carissa inside of Lyricist. She's dynamite. We just thought the world of her. She did a great job. So did we. Pardon? We really liked yeah, working with yeah, her on this as well. She did a good job. That, I had a lot of admiration for the way she handled the process. And so that was why and what happened at OU. And, uh, so. So just to clarify, we actually do have CAS uh, authentication available through Avalon. We just may not have been able to get it set up yeah, through Lyricist. Yeah, it was set up for us to yeah. test. So uh, we are open to questions now. Nice job.